Motherhood plays an important role in the Bible. It binds the beginning and the end. These stories offer us a glimpse into the heart of God. And so we start at the beginning. Taken from the side of Adam, gifted with bringing forth life, the first woman was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. But she was also a mother in her own right, the first of many mothers to come. Though Sarah's womb was closed, God promised nations and kings would come from her. Ten years pass, and motherhood seems as impossible as the day it was promised. But the Lord is faithful to keep his promises, and Sarah bore a son who made her laugh. Leah was the firstborn, overlooked by her husband Jacob, who gave his heart to her younger sister. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Despite Jacob's disdain, she found her motherhood in the Lord. When Pharaoh became angry at the fruitfulness of the Hebrews, Jochebed sacrificed her motherhood for the sake of her son. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she had compassion on him. Because of Jochebed's sacrificial motherhood, the Israelites found freedom. Naomi was a mother who experienced the loss of her sons, yet she gained a daughter in Ruth who declared, for where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth became family by faith. Mary, a virgin and not yet married, was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The motherhood of this blessed woman was more than the continuation of a family name, but a means for God to bring a savior into the world to save his people from their sins. From the garden to the cross, there have always been mothers. These women paved the way for all women, representing the full spectrum of the ways one could be called mom. Whether a mother in faith, mentorship, adoption, or by birth, you play an important role in the stories of generations to come. To all the Sarahs, Leahs, Jochebeds, and Naomis, Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We have a fun morning prepared for you, so let's, well, let's first, let's stand and let's sing together. count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out is working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. See, I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley.
sing it out. Yes, I Thank you so much for being here for Mother's Day, especially if you're visiting for the first time. Uh, so grateful that you're here uh, for us to just celebrate Mother's Day. And before we, we've got a couple baby dedications that we wanna do this morning. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to honor all the moms uh, in the sanctuary. So all moms, if y'all could stand up and just stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, way to go, moms. Okay. Okay, y'all can be seated, so bless y'all. We, we have the privilege and honor to uh, uh, baptize uh, kiddos from uh, two families this morning. And so just to let you know about baby dedication, uh, we can probably see the first one in 1 Samuel when Hannah comes uh, before the Lord and she cries her heart out there in the temple and Eli notices her and, and she wants to have a child and, and she commits to dedicate uh, her child to the Lord, and sure enough, God answers her prayer, and uh, she uh, commits uh, Samuel to the Lord, and we also see, obviously, Mary and Joseph uh, going to the temple uh, to, uh, to purify uh, Jesus uh, there in the temple and to be uh, recognized, and so uh, what we're doing today is a symbolic gesture of these two families coming together and saying, um, we know that our children are a gift from God. Uh, they are, God has blessed us with these children and we have a responsibility to be a good steward over them and we wanna come before the church, uh, come before the church family and we would like to publicly dedicate our children unto the Lord in order for, for them to, uh, for the church family also to get involved in, in uh, you know, helping uh, these children grow in their faith in the Lord. So we're excited to do that today. So the first um, family, let me introduce to you, this is uh, Larkin and Ashley. And Larkin and Ashley, they have Kyla and Cassidy. And Cassidy is the youngest one. <laughs> Cassidy, can you wave to everybody, honey? Can you wave to everybody? Kyla, how are you today? All right, good, a little, little shy. That's totally understandable. And so um, we'll, do, uh, we'll do Cassidy first, and so, Cassidy was born June 30th, 2021, and the meaning of Cassidy means clever. Can y'all see cleverness in her face? Look at that. I think that's a true statement. And her middle name is Morgan, and Morgan uh, is Ashley's maiden name, and so, um, so they, they named her that. So the scripture we want to read to you today is, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. All right, and so let's do Kyla. And so this is Kyla right here, and Kyla was born January 23rd, 2019. And Kyla means victorious, which is very appropriate because her parents waited many years and put their full trust in God to start their family, almost the same way uh, the scripture says about Hannah. And so a fact is that Kyla was named in honor of her mom's baby brother. His name was Kyle, and he lived a very short um, but loved life. And so Kyla is named after, after him. Um, and so, and her middle name is James. And James is every firstborn's name on the dad's side. So every firstborn's name. So what if, what if you didn't name her James? Would you have gotten in trouble? So, <laughs> You worked it out, okay, all right. So uh, we also have, so this is Connie Hayden. She's our, our preschool director. Connie, would you like to give these special? Hey, 
good. Yes. Um, this is one of our favorite days when our little ones are dedicated to the Lord in front of everyone. And we have special gifts here. It's a certificate for mom and dad to remember this day. And here's a book for you, Kyla. You and your sister can read. And this is one of our favorite books, Shepherding a Child's Heart. And then here are little Bibles for both of you. Thank you. There you go, Cassidy. Okay. Right. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's join in prayer and pray for these two precious kiddos. Lord Jesus, we just want to lift up Cassidy and, and Kyla to you. We just know that they are a gift directly from you. And Lord Jesus, we just want to praise you and thank you for this precious gift of life. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just watch over these two precious little girls, uh, that one day that they would come to know you and commit their lives to you. And Lord Jesus, I, I pray for Larkin and Ashley as they um, train up their children in, in your way. And Lord, I just pray that you would give them wisdom and strength and encouragement and energy. And Lord, as they seek to uh, raise these children um, uh, you know, to you, Lord, and train them up in your ways. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you again for them. I thank you for this precious family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you all so much. Now, now, okay, give them a round of applause. You know, before they leave, uh, I, I would like y'all to, uh, you know, this is a, you know, we raise our children uh, here in the church. Uh, it's kind of like a village. And uh, we all make an impact, whether it's just through prayer or encouragement, or maybe one day you're going to be their Sunday school teacher, and you're going to be teaching them. You're going to be in Bible study, maybe with Ashley in women's ministry. And so I would like for you to commit to join with them, to encourage them, to, to love on them, uh, and for them one day to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you will commit to support them and encourage them and pray for them, say, I will. All right, amen. Thanks again, y'all. Thank you so much. All right. All right, now we have Caroline and Justin Smith, and most of y'all know Caroline as Caroline Ledford before, and so they want to dedicate their um, beautiful baby boy uh, to the Lord and so, again, this is uh, Justin, and this is Caroline, and this is Silas Ray. Are you going to call him Silas Ray or just Silas? Um, well, we think it sounds like a sports announcer, so it's probably going to be Silas Ray. Silas Ray. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. All right. So, Silas was born on February 15th, 2022, and Silas means prayed for in Hebrew, and that's fitting for today. Ray means protector in German. And a little fact uh, associated with that, um, Ray is named after Caroline's grandfather, Dwight Raymond Ledford. The scripture that we want to, uh, you know, pray over them today is, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. First Peter 512. And Connie has a few things she would like to give to you. I do. And it's been so much fun watching Silas's mommy grow up. And now we get to watch Silas grow up and pray for him. Here's a Bible and the same books and a certificate to remember today. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, join with me as we pray for Silas. Lord Jesus, I just am so grateful that you blessed Justin and Caroline with a, just a precious baby boy. And Lord Jesus, thank you for Silas. Thank you for bringing him into this world. Thank you that he's healthy. And Lord Jesus, we just want to lift him up to you, Lord. Uh, we want um, him to bring glory and honor to you. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would just watch over him and protect him and keep him safe. And Lord Jesus, I pray that one day he would bow his head and his knee and claim you to be the Lord of his life. And Lord Jesus, we pray for that. And I pray for Justin and Caroline that, that you would just encourage them and help them as they uh, go through uh, parenting Silas. And Lord, I just pray that you would just give them courage and wisdom and that you would just watch over them and Lord, just help them as they uh, train Silas up in your ways, Lord Jesus. We just thank you uh, for this precious family 
and we pray your blessings on them. In Jesus' name, amen. And like we did before, if we could just kind of join in, uh, and if you will commit to pray for them and to encourage them uh, and just kind of help them as they parent Silas, uh, say, I will. All right, thank you very much. Love you guys so much. So proud of you, Justin. Is he a Texas Ranger? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, okay, of course. All right. Um, well, let's all stand and greet each other. I believe in all the fault. I believe God created heaven and earth. I believe God created man in his own image. God created male and female. I believe in the sanctity of life.
I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe our God is three in one. I believe in resurrection of Christ.
I believe in eternal life. I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe the Bible is God's word. the first I heard say I love you. I love my mom. She gives hugs and holds my hand. Says she's trying the best that she can. I love my mom. God gave me my mom. He chose her. She says, brush your teeth and clean your nose. I love my mom. A good night kiss and a prayer. She says, brush your teeth and run anywhere. I love my mom. God gave me my mom. He chose her for me. I trust him. chose life and gave me a home when the years speed by and I'm grown still I love my mom yes hey let's give them one more round of applause didn't they do amazing great job Amazing job. Let's also thank Megan Coronado. She organized this and did it, so let's give her a round of applause too. So grateful for her. I don't know if anyone else's allergies were acting up during that last song, but mine started acting up. Y'all did fantastic, great job. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for the moms here. We're thankful um, that you just have given us this time to celebrate them. Um, we pray, Lord, that ultimately you would help us to fix our eyes upon you and your goodness today, God. Thank you for your love that surpasses anything we could ever hope for or imagine, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross in our place. I pray for all these kids that are up here, Lord, that you would continue to work on their hearts, Lord, and equip the moms and dads to lead them well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. That's all right. Happy Mother's Day, moms. I'm not going to talk about you today. You've had your deal. That's it. 
I thought today would be a good day to talk to the men. There may be something, ladies, you could apply, but uh, you just think about uh, how wonderful your day is going to be. Not really. This guy named David Murrow wrote this book. And he did research because he believes that the numbers show that in church there's 70% ladies and 30% men going to church today. And you might look around and you might go yay or nay here. I'm not sure how to measure that. But uh, where are the men? That's his question, where are the men? And he gives some reasons why he believes that men don't want to go to church. Now, he's equating going to church as the result is you serve God, so you go to church, which 1 John says, if we love Jesus, then we're going to love God's people. And the word of God tells us that we are going to be committed to the church. We are going to be connected with the church if we love God. And so he ties it back to there's not just a problem with men not wanting to go to church, but he equates it as it's a faith problem because he says really the only measurement you have is church attendance, and so he measured that, and then he said, of course, there's something deeper than that. But here are some of the reasons he gives why men don't want to go to church. One is the preacher is boring. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Another reason he gives for not wanting to go to church for men is that the preachers are feminine. <laughs> you ain't got to worry about that, do you? <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not because, you know, I'm the pastor and I go where I go, but he ain't perfect, but he ain't feminine. I know that. <laughs> don't believe there's any... I have no skinny jeans in my closet <laughs> for obvious reasons. Yeah. They say another reason why men don't want to go to church is because the events are for ladies. And he talks about every time you have a fellowship, you've got tablecloths and you've got flowers on it and you've got nice napkins and all these things. And men don't like to go to that. They would rather go where there's meat and lots of it. And preferably only meat. That's what men want. And so he says that's a reason for it. And he lists some other reasons that most likely probably have some bearing to them. Not really sure. But obviously I, I, I think that he's on to something. And so on this Mother's Day, I would like to talk to the men. And if you come back for Father's Day, I might talk to the ladies. We'll see how that works out. The best Mother's Day present, men, that you can give the mothers in your life is not a perfect life, not perfection, but definitely holy direction. Joshua was a real man. Joshua was a tough man. Joshua had some Kit Carson in him. Joshua, if he played football now, he might have been Dick Butkus. Maybe he would have been Dick Butkus. I don't believe that Dick Butkus would have went with the other spies into the land that flows with milk and honey and come out and say, I don't believe there's any way we can whip them. I think Dick Butkus would have come out of the, uh, the promised land and said to Moses, well, it won't take long. We'll get after it. I think that uh, Joshua was a man of faith. He was a man of faithfulness. He was a family man, as we'll see today. He was a man of humility. You know, he played second fiddle for a long, long time. And he played second fiddle really faithfully. And a lot of leaders can't do that, but Joshua did. Joshua was obedient. Joshua persevered. He was a man of leadership. 
Joshua was a man of conviction. I mean to tell you, he, uh, he had deep, deep convictions about what was right and wrong. And for 110 years, he carried through. And he certainly had the ability to follow the Lord even when it was unpopular. And so Joshua, at 110 years old, towards the end of his life, he's just about done. And he stands up and he calls the men and the women together so he can talk to the men, kind of like Mother's Day. And he calls them all together and he gives them a Shechem choice. And he gave them this choice, very plain, without coercion, without manipulation, without guilt. He just laid it out there because he knew that for the survival of the nation and for the survival of the families, for the survival and, and, and the, the betterment of the children, there needed to be a time of decision. And I think it's kind of like it is today in our world. Man, uh, fellas, this is no time for you to be absent from your family. This is no time for you to be passive when it comes to raising your children. You don't have that luxury. You may have had the luxury in the times of Leave It to Beaver in the 50s when perhaps the biggest problem was a few beers on the weekend and graffiti, right? Or a hopped up 57, you know, Chevy driving too fast. Today, the world is far more complicated and far more difficult, and this ain't the day for men to be passive in their family. This ain't the day, men, for you to let your wife be the leader of your home. It ain't today. You can't afford that anymore. I mean, when, when your kids leave your home, in this day what you live in, they need to be ready to go. They need to be tough as nails. They need to be people of conviction. They need to have good critical thinking. You need to have spent lots of time with them beside the river, on the lake, in the backyard, wherever your time is, talking about how to handle real complicated issues in life. You just don't have that luxury today. You've got to sit down and talk to them. You've got to talk to them, and you've got to pester them, and you've got to stay with them. You have got to lead aggressively, and you have got to lead with a clear moral compass and a clear conviction about life. And, and I think that's what Joshua did for the people, and so that's what I want to do today on this Mother's Day in 2023 is call the leaders Call the elders, the old men, get them in there. It's not too late for them. Call the judges, call the officers, bring them all together. And he called them to Shechem, which is in modern-day Samaria, just north of Jerusalem, and he spoke to them. It says in verse 1, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, including their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. So it was a time of decision. Will they choose well? Now, once again, we, we discover towards the end of the chapter that uh, uh, Joshua was 110 years old. He had seen it all, hadn't he? He saw the Red Sea. He saw the manna. He saw the cloud by day and the fire by night. He saw the griping and complaining out in the desert. He saw the snakes biting the people and killing them. He saw Moses lose his temper and hit that rock more than he should. He saw all of that. He saw him weather storm. He saw him defeat enemies. He's been on the front lines. He saw the walls of, of Jericho come falling down. He saw when they went to Ai and, and they didn't obey God completely and they were destroyed. They were defeated and he saw how they regrouped and believed God and went back and were successful. And so he has seen that when you are faithful to God, he is faithful to you. But he's also seen when you are unfaithful to God, you may experience the judgment of God and the consequences of being unfaithful to the Lord. 
And so he wants to bring them all together. He knows his time is limited, but he's at his very best when his time was limited. So, man, if you're 70 years old, the best days are ahead. If you're 65 years old, your best days are ahead. You've got, you've got opportunity before you. Make the most of it like Joshua did. And so he gathers them all at Shechem. And then between verses 2 and 13, he just shares the history of God with the people. He said to the people in verse 2, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River. There was a time when we weren't. There was a time when we weren't even a people. There was a time God made that happen. And so he says, but I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. You remember in the Ur of Chaldees, Abraham was called. Abraham didn't know where he was going. He didn't know how he was going to get there. He didn't know the route. He just went day by day. All he had along the way is come follow me. Come follow me. And he did. And then at that moment, he said, all right, Abraham, here's what I'm up to. You're going to be the father of a great nation. Now, he's already up in age. And so he looks at his wife and he goes, ooh, miracles got to happen here. Because he says, we're going to be the father of a great nation. We're going to start it. We are going to have offspring. We are going to have a child. Well, how in the world is that going to happen? And, and God just says to him, here's what's going to happen is you are going to be the father of a great nation. And not only that, all the world is going to be blessed through you. All the world's going to be blessed through you. Wow. Boy, that just unloads on him. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir, while Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt. And afterward, I brought you out as free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after you with chariots and charioteers. When your ancestors cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. I brought the sea crashing down, the Egyptians drowning them. With your very own eyes, you saw what I did. Then you lived in the wilderness for many years, which is a miracle in itself to survive that wilderness for many years. Finally, I brought you in the land of the Amorites on the east side of the Jordan, they fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them. I gave you victory over them. I gave you victory over them. That could be one book of the Old Testament. I gave you victory over them. I've been giving you victory. Every time you turn around, it looks like you can't do anything. I give you victory. Every time it looks like you're done. Every time it looks like that, that there is no way you can survive what you're going through, I gave you victory victory. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Then Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He summoned Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you, and so I rescued you from Balak. When you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, and the Hivites, and, not to be last, but the Jebusites. But I gave you victory over them. They had a lot of ites they had to fight. A lot of ites were in the way. And God gave victory after victory after victory. And I sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you land you had not worked on. And I gave you towns you did not build. The towns where you are now living, I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. Man, it's a good idea to take a little inventory of all God has done for you. All God has done. First of all, 
There is in the inventory list a blank space, a blank space. You know what that blank space is? All the things God has done for us we're not aware of. There's a lot of them. You don't know about it because God just intervened. It may have been getting the job or not getting the job. It may have been getting a deal or not getting a deal. God intervened. It may have been on the highway. You have no idea. You don't know that at some point an angel took you the wheel of your car. You don't know that God delayed something that would have been a bad intersection for you. You don't know that. You don't know that, that you have been healed of some illness that you didn't even know you had. You don't know. We have no way of knowing. It's a mystery to us. There are all kinds of things that God has done for us that we're not even aware of, okay? We're not aware of how he strengthens us, how he carries us through, how he's given us ideas, how he's warned us in life. And he has been there for us. Even when life became more bearable than we could, more unbearable than we could handle, which the Bible allows to go through, when it says God won't put on you any more than you handle, that's talking about temptation, not problems. You may have had more problems than you can deal with, and like Paul said, you learn to lean on the Lord. There's no way of knowing all that God has done for us. I mean, think about forgiveness, complete forgiveness. He has done that. And so you can sit down and, and he's given you the ability to think. He's given you the ability to make money. He's given you the ability to work. He's given you the ability to, to, to have a home and these kind of things he's provided. James says he is the father of all good things. He's the father of all good things. So you take inventory of all that you have and the response is really important. How do we respond to all the good things the Lord has done? Well, Joshua just lays it out for the people. Since God has done all this for you, Israelites, verse 14, so respond number one, response number one, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. If he whipped them in Egyptians, you may experience a judgment that is beyond description. Fear the Lord. If God has the power to create the heavens and the earth, fear the Lord. If God is almighty and with one single breath, he can destroy cities and nations and, and, and just crumble civilization, fear the Lord. Have a holy respect for him. Have a fearful respect for the Lord. First step, fear is the beginning of knowledge, of understanding who God is. Joshua calls the people together and speaks, I believe, directly to the men at Shechem and says, because the Lord has done all this for you, fear the Lord. He says, not only fear the Lord, but he says, serve him wholeheartedly with all your heart, regardless of what other people are doing. Maybe they're half-hearted. Maybe they're a quarter-hearted. Maybe they're 10% hearted. They're not whole-hearted. Regardless of what's going on around you, it's needed today, wholehearted. Joshua knew what that was like. You remember when Joshua and Caleb returned, the Bible tells us that God provided for them and God worked for them because they were wholehearted for God. He had his hand on them because they were all in. They were wholehearted. They weren't leaving things out. They weren't hypocritical. They weren't, uh, you know, just uh, up and down, wishy-washy all the time. They hung in there. There was holy direction in their life. And so he says, fear God and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshiped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt. Put away the idols. Now, for them, it may have been some statues. For them, it may have been some artifact that they would carry around. For them, it may, be, it may have been the sun. It may have been the moon. It may be the water. There may be fire an idol that they worshiped. Joshua says, in this day in which we live, we gotta be careful. You gotta fear the Lord. You gotta serve him with all your heart and you've got to put away idols. I think the same is true for us today. The idols are different. The idols may be money, may be power, may be your opinion, 
maybe who you think you are, Ben, but you need to put them aside and serve only the Lord. That's what Joshua says here. Serve the Lord alone. That's what we need to do for our families. That's what we need to do for our wives. That's what we need to do for our mothers, our children, is we need to be firm, Joshua-like in our convictions and our faith. But in verse 15, no coercion, no manipulation. He just lays it out there. There, there, there's no gimmick in his presentation. He just lays it out there. This is what you need to do. I, I can see them looking at Joshua, hearing this, and going, man, he's a bad man. He's a man who's been just really faithful. He's devoted. He is sure put up with a lot of problems from us. We sure have been difficult for Joshua but he is, he's a warrior. He has fought hard. And here he is just laying it out. He says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? Choose. Let's settle this thing. If you're going to live for God, live for God. If you're not, live for your idol. Go for it. That's what he, he just lays out there. He said, you have a choice to make. You either choose God or you choose your own God, your own way, your idol. But then he speaks up. And, and man, I would like to have been there in Shechem on this day. Like to have been there. I, at this point, I, I, I can just see a man with firm jaw just eye-piercing looks, weathered face, weathered body. I'm sure it was hard for him walking up to wherever he walked up to to speak to them. And he says, but, but, that's a public commitment. Now, you worship whoever you want to worship, but you may choose to serve idols but you may go your own way, but I will serve the Lord. In the context of this, it's kind of like him saying, I may be the only one today who chooses to serve the Lord, but I will. I've seen it all. I've seen the hand of the Lord. I've seen his power. I've seen the judgment. I've seen it all take place. I know what it's like to be faithful to God and experience his blessings. I know what it's like to see people be unfaithful to God and see them just struggle and go through hardship as the Lord disciplines them. Regardless of what you choose, I will serve the Lord. And so he begins with a public commitment. And then he begins with a personal choice, and it's always a personal choice. He says, but as for me, it's not your dad's choice. It's not your mom's choice. It's not your wife's choice, fellas. It's your personal choice. I can't make the choice for you. No one can make the choice for you. It's your personal choice. You've got to come to the place in your life that you take ownership for your personal choice to be faithful to God and to serve him and be what he wants you to be. It's a personal choice. With the Lord, it's always a personal choice. And he says, and my family. But as for me and my family, that's persuasive. He's already starting. Joseph is publicly and personally testifying, declaring that he's going to lead his family. Now, all his kids may not be perfect. They may not grow up and serve the Lord. But as far as he's concerned, he's going to do everything he can that God is going to bless this effort and they are going to follow the Lord. 
He says, in my family, I'm going to be responsible to do my part. And then it all comes together in the, set, the very last phrase, uh, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. He says, we will serve the Lord. That's what he says. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Man, he's not saying I'm going to be in control of this situation. He's not saying that he is going to lord over people. He is not saying that he's just absolutely by his will going to make it happen. It's a positive faith. He's saying right here is he knows that the Lord is that faithful. How can you talk about the Lord who parted the Red Sea that destroyed the Egyptians that sent the fire by night and the cloud by day, manna and, and quail, and provided water in the middle of a no-water country. How in the world can I have any other mindset other than a mindset of positive faith? All I know is if I am devoted to God, God shows up and God's going to do what only God can do. And that's how I'm going to roll is what Joshua says there. I'm going to get after it for the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. I may be the only one. I may be the only one. Joshua would say this at church. Now, everybody, y'all may fall away and never come to church again. And I may come back and it's just me here, but I'm going to start right there being faithful. I'm going to start right there. Well, how are you going to do it? I don't have any clue, but it's the Lord's problem. It's not my problem. It's the Lord's problem. That's Joshua's mindset there. I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to serve the Lord. That's Joshua. That's the kind of men we need to have today, fellas. That's the kind of men we need to be. We need to be men that no matter what, we're going to lead our family. We need to be men that no matter what, we're going to lead in our church. We got we to gotta be in today regardless of what society crumbles to. We're not going to. We're going to hang in there. We're going to fight for what's right. We're going to fight for the faith. We're going to fight for morality. We're going to fight for serving the Lord, worshiping the Lord. We're going to fight for love and being real men in a real world with real problems serving our real God. That's what Joshua says here, I believe. And then we start in verse 16. The people replied, we would never ab 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 abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. Boy, can you imagine the atmosphere of that invitation? There's no way we're going to walk away from the Lord. Joshua, we're with you. You think you might go alone? You ain't going alone. We're going right there with you. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. Then Joshua warned the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you even though he has been so good to you. That's a warning from the Lord, isn't it? But the people answered to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. You are a witness to your own decision, Joshua said. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied. We are witnesses to what we have said. Look at verse 23. All right, then. All right, then. That's West Texas, isn't it? All right, then. We got it. We understand. We're on the team. We're not on the fence. We're in the game. All right, then, Joshua said. Destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God. We will obey him alone. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shechem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded these things in the book of God's instructions. As a reminder of their agreement, he took a huge stone and rolled it beneath the tree 
uh, terebinth tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord. Joshua said to the people, this stone has heard everything the Lord said to us. It will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word to God. He gets them where he wants them to be, but he's straight with them again. Men, you can mean all the right things at the right time, but if you don't follow through, you will reap what you sow. Well, we need to be warned of that, don't we? It's not an emotional experience. It's not an emotional decision Joshua's asking for here today. It's not an invitation where you have people, you know, on their knees and weeping and crying. Although if that's of the Lord, that's perfectly great. This is a decision. This is a decision that's going to last. And, and they're going to leave Shechem meaning business. That's what Joshua is after here. Then Joshua sent all the people away to their homelands. After this, in verse 29, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land he had allocated at Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Now look at verse 31. The people of Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him. Those who had personally experienced all the Lord had done for Israel. Now, Moses had something to do with it, obviously. Aaron had something to do with it, obviously. Obviously, right? God always builds on people. He always uses other people and other people's lives and other people's lives. But you have a testimony here that I reckon in heaven, Joshua would be pleased with. He did all he could as one man, responsible to the Lord, and there was results. If you're just alone, if you're just one man, one guy, and you will be faithful to God, there's no limit to what God will do and can do through one man who is wholly devoted to God. We're not at Shechem, we're in Alito. World is similar. Lots of idols around us. Lots of temptations around us. We've been gathered for a decision. On this Mother's Day, 2023, men, what decision are you going to make? For some of you, it might be a recommitment. You've already committed yourself to the Lord. But today, you're hearing the Holy Spirit say to you, this is a day of recommitment. I want my wife to be secure. I want my wife to, be, uh, 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 to grow in the Lord. I want her to understand what it is to be loved like no other. And I recommit myself to loving God, being faithful to him, serving him every opportunity. And the byproduct of that is my wife was going to strut around because she is loved unconditionally and she is going to be secure in that. And she is going to just rejoice to the high heavens. Because she is going to feel day after day that love. My children may be mad as a hornet at me because I put the law down. I, I, I hold them to accountability. I stay with them. I'm the unpopular dad. I'm the dad that says, you ain't going to wear that outside. Put your clothes on, girl. Well, you're not like so-and-so's dad. Good. I don't want to be like so-and-so's dad. I think so-and-so's dad doesn't go to church because he's afraid the preacher's feminine. You know what I'm saying, don't you? You're going to hold the line. 
But there's no question about your love for God, man, and there's no question about your love for your wife and for their mother, and and they may struggle through that, but at some point, if you'll hang in there, they're going to come around. Maybe they're going to be 35 years old, and they're going to come around, and so, Daddy, 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 thank you so much for showing me the way, for teaching me the way by putting up with my junk all those years. And you can stand beside Joshua in heaven one day and say, I had one assignment. That assignment was to lead and love the family that I had. And to not perfect, not being able to answer all the questions, not doing everything right, but to the best of my ability under God. I was a man of faith and I was faithful with that faith. What choice will you make, Phyllis? What choice will you make? Between you and the Lord. Recommitment or commitment for the first time. What decision will you make? So on this Mother's Day, 2023, the very best thing you can do for the moms in your life, men, is to be a man of faith and be faithful with that faith. Help us, Lord, to respond. Help us, Lord, to commit today. Help us, Lord, to leave this congregation today having made the decision that will honor you and honor our moms and our mothers and our wives and our children. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, please come forward. Stand and respond to the song. All my words fall short. I got nothing. could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end and you never do. So I throw up my Praise you again and again. So all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I have nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah. Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So all that I have is a hallelujah. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, my soul, 
Don't you get shy on me, lift of your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. And come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands. Help us to live for you. Help our hearts and our lives to cry, hallelujah, that you are alive and that you are reigning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Happy Mother's Day. You are dismissed. Have a great week.